people, I'm going to be a very, very, very fair person when it comes to this review. I'm not going to go off the deep end and make this rating of this pay-per-view a lot less than it is because I don't like the, the way it ended. I'm just going to be fair about this. So let's get started with the opening match. Pretty much I'm going to get started with the kickoff. I will say this. The kickoff was practically the best kickoff I ever saw. Seriously. The Shield and the Usos, they really did have a lot of chemistry in the ring. Even though we saw this match on SmackDown, these guys really brought the pain. And it really was a, a nail-biter. Like, it was a really great match to watch. And honestly, I, I was really impressed with how the Usos brought up their A-game. It made sense for the Shield not to win because the Shield is still a dominant faction. And it wouldn't have made sense for them to lose the belts this early. So, even though I agree with their win, I will say this. The Usos did bring it so they don't look bad. They don't look weak. This still was a fair balance match, and I liked it a lot. Um, and then after that was the actually uh, first Money in the Bank match was the World Heavyweight Championship match. I liked this match more than the All-Stars because it was all about the future. It was all about the future stars representing the brand. And having them come together and put on a really great match. we There was like maybe possibly four members that a lot of people were looking at to possibly win the Money in the Bank. Me, I only looked at two. And those two were Wade Barrett and Damian Sandow. As much as I would love to throw Cody Rhodes in there, no, he didn't have a shot in the dark. But I will say this. I really didn't see a lot of Damian Sandow in the ring, but Damian Sandow usually plays with his head more than his fists. And I will say that it was a very smart and genius way for him to win. It kind of sucked that he kind of, you know, stepped over his best friend to do it. But they both knew it was coming. But we all know there's going to be a feud between Cody and Damian. So it's something that's going to happen sooner or later. And it was a really great match to watch. I will say that. I was kind of rooting for Cody a little bit. And mostly I was rooting, rooting for Wade Barrett because I really wanted him to win. But he didn't. Oh, well. And it's Damian Sandow. And I don't really see Damian Sandow as a World Heavyweight Champion. I just don't. I'm sorry. I don't see him as a World Heavyweight Champion. Not yet. And now that he has the Money in the Bank briefcase. Oh, good grief. I really hope he has an interesting title reign whenever he decides to cash it in. But moving on from there, let's talk about the Divas match. The Divas, good grief. For the last few weeks, they have really impressed me. Not only did they, did they have a contract signing on SmackDown. This feud has literally put the Divas division back on the map again. I'm not going to lie. These girls really did impress me. AJ Lee was very in impressive. She was incredible. I never knew that she knew that many submission moves, let alone was able to take Caitlyn down, not once, but twice. And honestly, Caitlyn is all Bruce strength, but she has no idea how to get out the hole. She's not that good in how to get out of a submission hole. If she found out and, and found out and worked on that craft on how to get out submission holes, she'll be able to beat AJ. And I think that's something that's going to probably happen maybe at SummerSlam again. I'm hoping so because honestly, this feud is the best thing since sliced bread for the Divas division. So I think they're going to probably push it on as as much as they can. And it, but either or, it was a really great match to watch. I was highly impressed with AJ Lee as well as Caitlyn. Now moving on to the IC Championship match with the Miz versus uh, Curtis Axel. I really didn't care much for Curtis Axel at all. I thought Curtis Axel was just a mediocre guy. And the reason why he was pushed so quickly is because he happens to be Mr. Perfect's son. But honestly, after they got rid of um, the, the Paul Heyman, after the Miz out of the blue kind of pulled a heel move and like pretended to be smacked in the face by Paul Heyman, which was really clever, I might add, I will say that Curtis Axel really did impress me. It shows that he really does have the skill and the possible somewhat personality i mean he has some personality as a heel that he could possibly be able to pull it off but still i still don't see him as an ic champion but i really do say that he really did defend his cha championship well i will give him kudos for that i will say that um moving on from there to ryback versus um chris jericho <sighs> this match was freaking random like seriously it was so thrown together and honestly I'm realizing now they throw Jericho in feuds with people just to have the new talent to be put over because Jericho's that freaking good at doing it. Like, seriously, he's that freaking good at doing it. And honestly, even though he did not win, and people keep saying, Jericho needs to win. He's had so many losses. He needs to win. No, he don't. 
No, we don't. Chris Jericho's already been there, done that, got the t-shirt. He does not need to have any more wins. He's already proven that he's a great competitor. He's already proven that he is a true champion. He is the only undisputed champion, and he has proven that many, many times again. His job as a veteran now is to put over the new talent, and he put over Ryback really, really well. Even though Ryback had a really cheap roll-up pin, even though he was a monster heel and he could have dominated him. Yeah. But anyway, moving on from there. Um, <laughs> let's move on to the World Heavyweight Championship match. Yeah, Alberto Del Rio. Oh boy, Alberto Del Rio versus... Um, oh, sorry, I almost fell asleep. <laughs> Alberto Del Rio versus Dolph Ziggler. Now, to be completely honest, this was practically the most boring match I've ever watched in my life. Like, for the first... Good grief, it felt like forever. For the first three minutes of the match, I was like downright about to fall asleep. It was that boring. But then it did pick up at, in the middle, and it did start to get interesting, especially with Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler really is truly a show-off, but he's not a face. He's more of a heel. He has the whole show-off um, persona, and it fits more of a heel than a face. But regards to that, that's another video coming. But let's, let's be real here. Dolph Ziggler is a better champion than Alberto Del Rio because Alberto Del Rio is so freaking boring. Like, seriously, he is very, very boring. But the really thing that kind of made it really sour for me was the ending. Why on earth are you going to have AJ Lee to be the reason why he lost? I would have been more satisfied to have Ziggler be pinned and have his comeuppance at SummerSlam than him losing because AJ interfered. It made him look, I really don't know what to say. I can't really say it made him look weak because it was something that he didn't expect. But I will say that it just, it wasn't needed. It really was not needed at all. All he needed was to have a clean loss and then have a come up its story building up towards SummerSlam. That's what he would actually need more than anything else. But having AJ be in the middle is just so, oh gosh. So last year, so last WrestleMania, like, <laughs> come on, man, no. But there's another segment that really didn't make any sense. Why on earth are you going to have Brad Maddox come out and pretty much kind of humiliate and, well, let's just say downright humiliate Vicky Guerrero again on a pay-per-view for a segment that should be on Raw? Why? I mean, there's so many, there's so much filler that you can probably do, like have a random match there or something. Like, you could have done something else, but it didn't make any sense to have Brad Maddox there and to have this whole Vicky Guerrero thing. It should have been done. Like, seriously, come on. No, it was stupid. And here we go to the WWE Championship match. Now, this made me happy. It made me happy that this was not the main event because it showcased the Money in the Bank ladder matches to be the main events at the beginning as well as the end. So that made me happy to know about that. But the one thing that did not make me happy was this. How on earth can John Cena, somebody who couldn't even pick up Mark Henry on Raw, not only do it once, but twice in this match? Made no sense whatsoever. And not only that, was able to make the giant tap. The guy was a freaking beast. You were downright afraid of him for almost two or three weeks. Why in the world all of a sudden you gather all of this Hulk strength, oh my bad, Super Cena strength, and somehow was able to pull all these moves off at the last minute? Now, what really made me even more annoyed was when someone, I can't remember who, either Michael Cole or someone kept saying this was a David vs. Goliath style match. It is not. Don't you dare call it that. And the reason why is because David was supposed to be the underdog. People consider him to be the underdog, even though he had major backing on his side. And he wasn't afraid of nothing. He was fearless. I cannot say that John Cena was the same thing because, number one, it was expected for him to win. He, was, he, he even expected it to win. He even knew that he was going to win. So we can't really say that it was a David vs. Goliath style match, even though he was fighting a giant. We can't. I'm sorry. Because John Cena already knew that he was going to win and he was going to be dominant in the whole match. We knew this. He knew this. So we can't call it that. And that's the only thing that kind of ticks me off is that it was not natural enough. It just, it just wasn't. I'm sorry. 
It was something that was too expected, too predictable, and even he knew that he was going to win. Ridiculous. But moving on to the main event of the night. The All-Stars match. Ladder match for Money in the Bank briefcase. Um, okay. There were so many freaking rumors going on Twitter, going on Facebook, going on all different kinds of dirt sheets for wrestling about who was going to be the replacement seventh guy to come out and actually compete. And there wasn't any. There was like from Big Show to Kofi Kingston and then we kind of threw that out the door because they were up there in commentary. So then it was all about Brock Lesnar. So we all was expecting Brock Lesnar to come out and no Brock Lesnar. So automatically I thought in my brain that okay, since we have no seventh guy, that means that RVD is going to take it all. Wrong. <laughs> RVD did not win it at all. And I actually thought that he was good. He was pretty much the fan favorite. Everyone was chanting RVD's name. But then you already had a guy that was a lot more over than RVD, and that was Daniel Bryan. And you thought he was going to actually win, because not only did he beat Randy Orton not once but twice, he's actually put over by the Yes Chant. So you would think that he would actually win this match, right? Wrong. Freaking Randall Keith Orton ended up winning the entire thing. Why? Seriously, why? It makes no sense. I know that there's so many Randy Orton fans out there that are probably so happy and like clicking their heels and doing cartwheels and all this other stuff. It does not make any sense for Randy to win. Randy's been there, done that, got the teacher nine times. It made no sense for him to get it because he didn't have to. He's a member of the Breakfast Club. He can get any match he wanted to randomly. So why on earth would he get the money in the break briefcase when he should have gave it to, Rand uh, to to Daniel Bryan? It would have made more sense for Daniel Bryan to win. I'm sorry. Not only that, it kind of made RVD's return a complete waste. It really was. So the entire ending of the of, of the All-Stars match made no sense. Plus, it did kind of start something with CM Punk. And it did kind of show that Paul Heyman kind of went against CM Punk and kind of cost him the entire Money in the Bank match. So that's something to look forward to on Raw. But I will say the ending just did not satisfy me. And just for that alone, as well as the John Cena match, the match ending for the All-Stars match, and a segment for the Raw segment that's supposed to be on Raw, but on the pay-per-view, I have to give it an 8 out of 10. For that reason, for that reason alone. But the entire pay-per-view itself was very solid. Very good matches that impressed me. I was literally on my feet. It was I was literally screaming at the screen on pins and needles. Seriously, it was a really great pay-per-view to watch. But those three segments kind of messed things up for me. So I have to give it an 8 out of 10 for that reason. I'm not going to downgrade it because of the wrestler that I didn't like. I'm just absolutely going by the flow of the storyline as well as the build and how it would make sense for the characters to actually win the match. So for that reason alone, I am giving it an 8 out of 10, and that's still a good rating. But I'm curious to hear what you guys think about this. How do you rate Money in the Bank? Leave a comment in the comment section below or send me a video response. I'm curious to hear what you guys think about Money in the Bank and what you would change about it and whether or not you're going to be excited about it next year or SummerSlam. Either or, it's in, it's in y'all's court right now. This is Nature Girl 30 signing off. Peace out. Later.